This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Jeff Strand. He is the author of a bunch of demented books, including Pressure, Dweller, A Bad Day for Voodoo, and Wolf Hunt. He is a four-time Bram Stoker Award finalist, and he is a ten-time Bram Stoker Award Master of Ceremonies. And let me tell you, Jeff Strand is one of the best working writers today, particularly in that kind of horror comedy crossover space. And if you haven't read him, then you absolutely should. And this was a fun conversation. We covered a lot of ground. It is a two-parter, as are most of our conversations. And I think you're going to be both entertained and educated. But before any of that, let's have... A little bit of an advert break. If you're an emerging author in the UK, Storyville is offering its first ever online contemporary dark fiction class in 2021. Running from 16 weeks from May to September at 8pm London time, there are weekly essays, assignments and readings to help you hone your craft. Richard Thomas runs Storyville. He's an experienced author, editor, teacher and publisher who has been nominated for the Bram Stoker, Shirley Jackson and Thriller Awards. Use the code HORA10 to get 10% off. Head on over to StoryvilleOnline.com today as spots are limited. In Black Crane's Tales of Unquiet Women, horror writers of Southeast Asian descent reject and embrace these traditional roles in a unique collection of stories which dissect their experiences of otherness. Black Crane's is a dark and intimate exploration of what it is to be a perpetual outsider. Featuring 14 stories by acclaimed writers and including a foreword by award-winning writer Alma Katsu. Omnium Gatherum is thrilled to be a sponsor of This Is Horror. Enter the code THISISHORROR with no spaces at checkout for a 20% discount. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Jeff Strand on This Is Horror. Jeff, welcome to This Is Horror. Thank you for having me. I don't, to begin with, if we could talk about any early life lessons that you learned growing up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Well, I learned that it gets very cold. Um, you know, the, the question will come up, did anything horrible happen to you as a kid? And the answer is generally no. But my idiot friend and I, when we were probably 10 years old, did fall into a frozen over river and avoided being swept away to our death. But um, it basically involved intense stupidity where we were on the side of the riverbank, frozen over, but not safe to walk on. And we were just throwing rocks, trying to break through the ice. So normal, safe activity, throwing rocks, (laughs) breaking through the ice, (laughs) no problem. Until we ran out of rocks. Now, Without the rocks, you know, because it was all, you know, this was Alaska, this was winter, everything covered in snow, rocks were not easy to find. We weren't willing to dig through snow to find rocks. We wanted to stick to the small quantity of rocks we had already acquired. So where were the rocks? They were the ones that had not broken through the ice. So for some reason, and we, you know, this wasn't last week, this was, you know, decades ago, we decided, well, you know, we'll reach out, you know, we're not going to walk onto the ice, but we will, from the safety of the shore, reach out and get the rocks. And um, in that process, we both broke through the ice, avoided being swept away to an icy early death. We 
managed to climb our way out. And then, when, you know, so that was an early horrifying near-death experience, but it also led to, you know, the creation of fiction because we knew how stupid that was. And we knew that if we went back to our parents and said, hey, the reason we are soaking wet and scared is that we were so dumb that we were trying to get rocks off the ice. So we had to basically, you know, do an elaborate lie for why we were, you know, how it happened. We had to make sure it held up to logic, you know, because there would be an interrogation. So it was basically on our way home in our wet snowsuits, you know, concocting the fictional version of what had happened. So it was a you know, horror writer origin story and also a fiction writer origin story because the, you know, it had to hold up. You, you know, the characterization had to work, the motives had to work, mm -hmm. you know, the logic, you know, the physics involved, everything had to make sense when we were interrogated because if we admitted to that stupidity, they would basically say, all right, you stay indoors for the rest of your lives because you're not capable of <laughs> interacting with the environment. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, and it, it begs the question then, I mean, so what was the version that you concocted, and did your parents go for it? Uh, parents did not go for it. Basically, <laughs> we went to my, what happened was we, I had been, you know, spending the night at my friend's house, so we went back to his house. So his parents saw us wet, traumatized, and so they bought it. You know, so then once we um, switched to my parents, they saw it after the fact. So their view was, you know, I'm safe, I'm warm, I'm not in a wet snowsuit, not scared. So to them, it was like, that that doesn't make any sense. Because I'm not saying that we successfully created a logical story. And I don't even completely remember the details, except that it changed with each telling. <laughs> not by me, but my friend. Yeah. So he would... He would. He, consistency was a problem. We had continuity errors that would pop up in the retelling, and so my parents were like, "No, that that's not what happened." But you know, they every once in a while, my dad would say, "You know, what, we're going to drive out to the river, and you're going to, we'll do a thorough check of your story." But he never did. But but yeah, it was kind of it was the realization that you need to have a consistent fictional narrative. You can't change it you have to the rules of your universe have to be consistent or else you upset the reader which is what we did with my parents because he changed the story every time we told it mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i'm wondering <laughs> why there was a situation why you just had to keep retelling it were they kind of cross-examining you i mean why did the story well, no, get told so much <laughs> well it's because you know we were two kids who broke through the ice on a dangerous river and lived to tell the tale. So whenever my parents would have friends over, like, hey, tell them what happened when you broke through the ice. So it was one of those, you know, it was yeah. an anecdote yeah. worth sharing. It was an exciting moment. So it wasn't like, you know, speak not of this. It was, hey, tell us about how you almost died, how, you know, this should be a day of mourning, but you guys survived. Yeah. Yeah. And how old were you then? About 10. Yeah. So mm -hmm. old enough to know better. It's not like a three year old yeah. toddler one. You know, there, you know, the element of stupidity cannot be overemphasized. I'm not, you know, saying, well, we should have, you know, I'm not saying, you know, we were young. We didn't know any better. We knew better. It was a poor decision from two intelligent kids who, in that moment, were not intelligent at all. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is that now, you know, hindsight, so many years later, do you ever feel like that you should go back and edit that story? <laughs> <laughs> kind of give it a director's cut. <laughs> I, what I should, you know, we never confess to me. You know, if my mom listens to this <laughs> podcast, she'll be, I knew it. <laughs> but, so no, we never went back and, you know, said, okay, remember that one time when we were complete idiots? But, <laughs> yeah. you know, so no, there's not been a truly definitive answer except for the truth, which was intense stupidity. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And 
I mean, I guess you had some training prior to that with stories, because my understanding is that you were first reading stories at three years old. So, I mean, was yeah. that reading solo? Did you have a parent or grandparent? What were those first experiences with story like for you? Well, my mom liked you know, my mom was an avid reader. My dad was an avid reader. None, not, no horror at all. They did not like horror, but um, they were both extremely avid readers. So, you know, my dad was never not reading a book. And my mom, you know, she was part of a Harlequin romance club where they would send you a box of books every single week. And by the time the next box came, she would be ready for, them. you know, there were, you know, she had a whole shelf and she'd read every single one of them. So they both loved to read. And so, you know, as a kid, I got read to, you know, from the beginning. And it was, you know, they would sit down, read a picture book, read the same picture book, and then, hey, Jeffrey, try it. And then I would, you know, so by, you know, I got a really early start. And then, yeah, by the age of three, you could hand me the picture book and I could read it. And so my grandmother was telling me about it. And she's like, you know, you weren't that impressive because they said, hey, Jeff can read. And she said, no, he can't. He's three. Prove it. <laughs> so she handed me a page of a newspaper and she said, you, you didn't do a great job. You could <laughs> basically get there. It wasn't like fluent, you know, flawless dictation. It was, you know, you stumbled over some stuff. So don't get too impressed by yourself. But yeah, I, by three, I could, I could read pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause my daughter is two and a half. So I guess, I mean, she can like kind of retail, a picture book, but I'll I'll have to give her that kind of newspaper test in six months, and if if yeah. she fails it, if she flunks it, I'll you know I'll have to tell her. It's like, well, I think you're a bit behind. I think we've got some considerable yeah. work to do. So I think it was abnormal, but you know I got an early start, and there were many other things I was bad at to balance out being good at reading. So yeah. You know. It yeah. wasn't like I was a sports champion and a math wizard and could read. It was like I sucked at math and I could was terrible at sports, but I could read. So, you know, I was there. It was counterbalanced by my badness at other things. Yeah, yeah. And so when did you first get into genre? So I know that... From an early age, you were having nightmares via Star Trek 2, and I know that you were also yeah. drawing Spider-Man stories. So, I mean, was, was one of those the the origin story of your interest in genre? No. Though, you know, uh, Star Trek 2, I didn't enjoy that experience. That wasn't, you know, there's, Star Trek 2 has the scene with the leeches in the ears, and I was mm -hmm. not prepared to be seeing that and it wasn't for me a fun scare it wasn't wow that creeped me out and I liked it that was oh my god that creeped me out and I never want to go through that again uh, genre for me was probably comparatively late to most other horror authors I didn't really get into horror until high school so up until then you know I liked old stuff you know I liked King Kong that you know the original Black and white King Kong, I really liked. I liked Mighty Joe Young. But as far as, you know, contemporary horror films, that happened in high school, and it was kind of a peer thing. It wasn't that I discovered it on my own. It was the social group of friends I made. They were into comics, which is how we met, because I was, you know, a, I was very briefly a comic book fanatic. It was like maybe four years of really, really intense comic fandom and then i dropped out of it like almost immediately cold turkey but um so my i met both the comics and they were into horror films so it's like well if i'm going over to my friend's house and they're watching five horror movies a night i guess that's what i'm doing i would rather watch monty python than the holy grail but you know what? let's let's see if this evil dead thing is angry and then it was kind of a gradual it wasn't like my like, gosh i should have been watching these all along it was uh, and then well no this is this is okay. Now goes my Python and the Holy Grail, and then, you know, within a year, I was you know full on horror fan who would watch them on my own, and then that you know stuck with me for the rest of my life. So, but it didn't start until high school. 
Yeah, and I wondered, did you ever bring along any Monty Python? Did you manage to negotiate? Like, right, we're watching five horror movies, so why don't we this evening watch four and we'll throw a bit of Python into the mix? Oh, yeah, we watch My Python, My Python and the Holy Grail like every week, and then there would be the horror movies along with it. Nice. And this was back when you actually had... This wasn't back when you had the DVD, could watch it anytime you wanted. We had to go to the video store, rent it every single week. So, you know, we were paying to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail every weekend. And really, weirdly, it was, Holy Grail was the only one we watched repeatedly. We watched Life of Brian a couple times, meaning a life a couple times, but generally it was, you know, Holy Grail was the one we just watched over and over and over and over and laughed every time. And then I made my mom and sister watch it, and two people had never hated a movie more. Like the hate waves of hatred coming off both of them as I made them watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail was like you could actually see the hatred coming out of their eyeballs as they watched that movie. But we, I loved it. We watched it every single week. Yeah, that's how my mom was when she watched The Meaning of Life. She thought that. There was no reason anyone should watch any any film like that at all. Yeah. While me and my dad cackled, you know, madly, and would go around the house singing "Every Sperm Is Sacred." <laughs> but, well, they didn't know. like silliness and they didn't like gore. And what is Monty Python? Yeah. It's yeah. silliness and gore. Yeah. No. Not yeah. really. Exactly. You know, they weren't the demographic for those movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying then is years later, they're not the biggest fans of your fiction. <laughs> well, they, they're fans of some of it. And they're not afraid to say which ones they like and don't like. But I think that they have gradually, you know, at first it's like, why do you write that? You know, my dad would always have different genres I should be writing. You know, you need to write a really good heist thriller. Why don't you write a really good mystery? Why don't, you know, he didn't want me to write horror. But then he read my book, Wolf Hunt, and was like, hey, that was actually, I really enjoyed that one. And so, you know, my mom, she doesn't like the gruesome elements, but she'll say, you know, aside from the stuff that I did, got real squeamish over, I like the story. And, you know, she, I have a book, Clowns vs. Spiders. She won't enjoy that. I don't think she's read it. She, You know, that's not going to be a book for her. She will read that and get no value out of it. But something like pressure, you know, aside from the gruesome element, she really enjoyed. So they kind of, you know, my sister enjoys a lot of my stuff. My dad liked some of them, but they're not, you know, my number one cheerleader fans. They're not like every book my son writes is a masterpiece. It's, I think, you know, my mom would still enjoy it if I wrote a, you know, a cozy mystery or whatever. But, but I don't, you know, Pretty much since I achieved, you know, quote unquote success, you know, they stopped saying, well, you should write something different. It's like, okay, you, whether we like it or not, you have people who do like it. So we'll go with that. Yeah. And I mean, one of your first books, Grave Robbers Wanted, No Experience Necessary. I mean, that started off and was intended as being a whodunit mystery, but, you know, you then got put into the horror genre that was... I guess the right. genre that really picked it up and responded to it. Yeah, the Andrew May series, the origin of that series was not at all what the books became, even the first one. It was, you know, I was experimenting with different stuff. I had, I, I kind of nailed my writing voice, but not the genre I wanted to write in. So I was trying lots of different stuff. It's like, well, you know what, what if I did a mystery? And what if I did, you know, I, my intention was I was just going to, that's what I was going to write. I was going to write Andrew Mayhem book after Andrew Mayhem book after Andrew Mayhem book. You know, that was going to be what I did. And so I thought, you know, a whodunit mystery. So I worked out the details and then just throughout the process of writing it, it got way darker. And I realized I don't actually like the whodunit mystery element. I think it works in the book, but it wasn't fun to write. It was a pain to write. It was a pain to keep consistent and, you know, dropping the clues. And there was all this stuff. Like, I'm not really enjoying the writing of this book. So um, it once the book was done, it was like, wow, that is way darker than I ever thought. But I'm happy with it. And then I sent it to my agent. And he's like, no, this book sucks. Because 
he didn't want you know I try to make it laugh out loud funny. He didn't want laugh out loud funny. He's like, you know, the mystery, humorous mysteries are not laugh out loud funny. It's not over the top, wacky, you know, splattery, dark comedy. It's the occasional witty line. So he was like, I can't sell this. And it's dark and gruesome and weird. And so, um, you know, it ended up not at all being the mystery book. And I kind of, I, when the book first came out, I called it a mystery, and then I switched to thriller. And I called the books still say an Andrew Mayhem thriller, but I promote them as horror comedies, which is what they are. And with the second book, I did a twist beginning, which eliminates the um, whodunit mystery element. And then after that, the books just became straightforward horror comedies. Yeah, and did you soon depart ways with that? agent because i imagine you having an agent that says can we tone down the humor it doesn't sound like a great match for you no yeah we we parted ways very quickly after that and i would like to say yeah i fired him but it was vice versa it was he didn't want to represent that book so i chucked it into the trunk and then i wrote another book and he was like all right good luck with that one like oh i okay and yeah. so <laughs> I, I, I see where this is going. Yeah, he basically had taken me on because of a comedy book I'd written called um, How to Rescue a Dead Princess. Mm. And he, you know, he's like, I had already submitted it to a bunch of publishers. And that book is just, in, you know, that was my Monty Python inspired book. So it is just, you know, joke, 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 pure silliness, doesn't care that much about the story. And I had submitted to a whole bunch of places. So when I contacted him, it was like, just FYI, I've sent this out to you know, a dozen publishers already, and they've all rejected it. And so he said, you know, I'd have to be insane to take this on, but I love the book so much, I'm going to try. And of course, he was not successful. And so we, I sent him, you know, three or four other books. And after Grave Robbers, he didn't want to rep them anymore. And then, you know, after the book after that, he said, you know, take the hint and stop sending me stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's been, you know, when pressure first came out, I sold, uh, there had been a hardcover small press edition, but I sold the um, big publisher edition without an agent. So I was like, well, I need an agent to negotiate the deal. And so I, you know, it's very easy to get an agent when you have an offer on the table. And so I had, I reached out for suggestions. I had two agents who people said, you know, these are good. And so the first agent said, yeah, I will absolutely represent this. I see that you also do a lot of horror comedy just to let you know I'm not interested in that. So like, okay, well, that makes it easy. I'll go with the other one. So yeah, because, you know, it's the market has changed a lot. You know, when I started there, you know, there was not a lot of blatantly humorous stuff. There was humor existed in books. But as far as, you know, a Christopher Moore did not exist. Uh, David Wong was not out there. You know, Grady Hendrix wasn't, you know, now you, you say it's horror comedy and it's like these people. There's a sales track record to sort of let an editor know what you're trying to do. But when I started back when I was, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, sending stuff to agents there wasn't a track record of someone who was doing that kind of stuff and so they had nothing to go on so it's like well people don't like funny books so peddle your crap elsewhere yeah i just find it so bizarre that someone took you on with a book called how to rescue a dead princess and then was seemingly surprised that there was humor in subsequent books mm. yeah it was i think what he wanted me to do was write a completely mainstream mystery, you know, because, um, you know, I went to the bookstore, I was doing market research, and it was like, you pull these mysteries off the shelf, and it says, you know, hilarious, laugh out loud, funny, a gut buster. And he's like, yeah, but read the actual books. They're a mild witticism every other chapter. And I didn't, like, okay, he is correct. It is a mild witticism every other chapter. It is not full-blown splattery antics but you know so he was right to that degree and probably if i had written a more straightforward type book he would have sold it and i'd be very rich now and i would say i'm not coming on your podcast unless you you know meet all my demands 
but I didn't. So, so he was probably right, but I also am happy that I stuck to my guns and wrote the stuff that spoke to me. Yeah. But I think as well, in terms of your work generally, I mean, there's a great variety in terms of where they fall on the horror comedy spectrum. And I know that you mentioned Wolf Hunt earlier, and I think that's the book that you often recommend for people to start with purely because it's in the middle there. Correct. But I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, when you initially start to write a story, do you kind of know which mode it's going to be in, whether it's going to be, you, you know, one that's more comedic or whether it's going to be the bleakness of, let's say, Dweller, or is it a case that the story comes first and then the level of humour will, will seep in later? No, I kind of, I generally know, you know, based on the story. So, you know, if I, like, for example, Ferocious. Ferocious is about two people who live off the grid. They live in a cabin in the middle of the woods, and then the um, animals basically turn into zombies. So they have a whole forest of undead animals that are surrounding the cabin. So from there, you know, it's not going to be a dark, bleak, nihilistic book. It's going to be fun horror. But, okay, I've got that. I want you to like these characters and really root for them to get out. So funny characters tend to be more likable, as long as they're not obnoxious. But if they can make the reader laugh, they're more likable than characters who ne aren't necessarily making the reader laugh to some degree. So it's like, you know, there's going to be a tongue-in-cheek element to the action because it's zombie animals. When I say there's a zombie grizzly bear breaking into <laughs> the, you know, cabin, that's there's an element of tongue in cheek to that. It's cartoonish to some degree. So you've got that. And then you've got, um, you know, characters who their interactions with each other are funny. They're funny people. They're not, you know, when a zombie grizzly bear is trying to bite their leg off, they're not saying something wacky, but in the quiet moments, they're funny characters. So it's like from there, I've got the tone. It's, I'm not going to do anything that violates the danger of the situation. So my characters are not going to be saying things that you wouldn't say if a zombie grizzly bear was coming at you. But there can be an element of tongue in cheek. I can get humor out of the sheer outrageousness of the situation because the zombie animals are sort of evil dead style, meaning that when they are dismembered, you know, when you fight back with the chainsaw, the different parts of the animals keep attacking. So once you've gone that over the top, it's kind of a comedic tone that's appropriate. Now, Dweller is, you know, a sad book. It's, it's still, it's a monster book. It's a monster book like Ferocious, but the tone is very different. So there's a lot of humor in it, but it's all character-based. There's no over-the-top moments in Dweller that are funny because of how, because of the sheer insanity of the situation. All the humor comes from the interactions between the characters. And same thing with pressure. Pressure is a very, very dark thriller. There's humor in it. It's much more sporadic. It's used more for comic relief and for character development. It's not really used just, you know, throughout. It's it's a lot more sporadic. So I do figure out pretty early on based on the story where it's gonna be there aren't many books now. You know, I'm s i am talk about how Grave Robber surprised me with the tone, but that was, you know, 45 books ago. Now I kind of know what the tone is going to be before I get too far into it. There'll be some fine tuning. So what usually it's around the three or four chapter mark. So I'll be writing clowns versus spiders. Now, when you hear that I wrote a book called clowns versus spiders, you know that it's not going to be a dweller or a pressure. It's going to be fun type horror. But I thought I went a little bit too far. What had happened was I had too much of a deadpan reaction to horrible things happening at the beginning. And I said, no, I'm not going to go deadpan. I'm going to go, um, I'm going to give them real, I'm going to have the characters always aware of the true horror of what's happening, but still they're clowns. So they can say things in those situations that real people might not say. So I kind of, it's a lot more stylized 
in terms of the comedy. It, it, it allows for stuff that I wouldn't allow in one of the more quote unquote serious books. So it, it varies from book to book. Some books are as funny as I can make them. Some books I scale it back, but it varies. But I do know the tone generally pretty early on. I know whether it's going to be everything believable or whether I can crank it up a couple notches. Yeah. And how did your peers react when in the fifth grade you wrote a story called Falstaff the Fearless? I'm, I was a minor celebrity after that. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a story, you know, Falstaff the Fearless, which sounds like a Shakespeare reference, but was actually a Dungeons and Dragons reference. There's a reference to Falstaff the Fearless in um, the Dungeon Dragons Players Sandbook. So that's where I took it from. I didn't realize it was a Shakespearean thing. And it was just this goofy little story, which I honestly thought it was a comedy story. It's not funny at all. And my mom was like, it's not a comedy. I'm like, no, it is. It's like, no, it I didn't make me laugh. But I envisioned it as a comedy. And the Alaska, the Fairbanks, Alaska newspaper, the Daily News Miner, would have an occasional section where um that would feature stories by kids and what happened was my story was longer than most of them so i got the full section except for a piece of art but the piece of art was by a 12th grader which was the upper end of what they allowed so it was my fifth grade story but it was accompanied by an unrelated but really good piece of art so when you're flipping through you're like, oh wow look at that drawing that that's an impressive drawing i wonder what story is next to it so you know it was the achievement was made by other people in my school but mine i had this, the whole section of myself with great accompanying artwork so you know for and of course this was long ago so there wasn't the level of you know competition so if you had a story in the week you know in the daily newspaper people read the daily newspaper it wasn't like oh yeah newspapers those are gone now so this was when, you know, maybe the kids weren't reading it, but all the teachers were. So I had, you know, it wasn't long lived celebrity, but for that week, everybody had read my story and, you know, claimed that they enjoyed it. You generally don't go to a fifth grader and say, wow, that story, not, not that great. So you're, <laughs> you know, you've got to do better if you're going to make it in this business, kid. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, the level of praise was appropriate for a fifth grader who wrote a story that maybe was slightly better than what other fifth graders were writing. Mm. And do you think having that reaction and that uh, minor celebrity dumb within the, the town, did that give you a kind of appetite for writing? Did you know or have an inkling that that was something you wanted to go on and do professionally? Oh, I knew it way early on. So mm. it was, you know, people like, what's your origin story? And like, there really isn't one because I've wanted to be a writer literally for as long as I can remember. You know, I can't remember being three years old, but I can remember, you know, always wanting to be a writer. And, you know, I did a whole series of Falstaff stories. And at one point, my fifth grade teacher said, you know, what? we've got this, there's this outdoor, not outdoor, a outside the classroom display and it would change every couple of weeks and it would be different class projects. And she said, Hey, put all your stories up there. So I put all my stories up there. And so for two weeks, it was everyone who walked by, wow, look at all of Jeff Strand's stories. He's going to be a famous writer someday. Never imagining it would take, you know, a long, long, long time to never achieve fame, but to achieve, you know, enough success to do it full time. But, you know, for two weeks, I had the fifth grade of that particular class uh, display. And then I got my first, you know, negative feedback because she said, all right, it's been two weeks, time to take it down, replace it with something else. So I was the one who did it. So I was out there taking the stories down, taking the different pages down, and some kid walked by and he's like, oh, I'm glad that crap's coming down. And that was my first one star Amazon review equivalent. And I didn't, I, it, it also um, showed how I react to Amazon one star reviews, which was screw you, I don't care. Other people enjoy them. I don't need 100% uh, 
customer satisfaction. So, but yeah, this kid just, well, thank God that crap's coming down and yeah, whatever. You didn't get your two weeks of a uh, display outside your classroom. Did you indeed respond to the review, <laughs> to the comment, or did you just let him no, I, let him walk I, by? I let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I let him walk by. My behavior in school was impeccable. So I, you know, getting into a fight with a kid in the hallway would never, under any circumstances, have happened. Not to mention that he would have kicked my ass. That was another issue. <laughs> yeah. So no, I just kind of like, yeah, whatever. And then went back to taking the stories down. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a measured <laughs> approach you will consider. I, I mean, <laughs> now he's, you know, living a miserable life and unhappy with everything and, you know, three times divorced and broke and miserable. That's what I assume his future is, but I don't, we never interacted after that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how I feel about most negative reviews of, of my work. It's like, well, it has to be that you're a deeply unhappy person. I mean, it c couldn't be anything yep. else. That is the only conclusion I can reasonably make. Yeah. And a lot of times it's true. And then there are other times, you know, I, I read my reviews pretty obsessively. And there'll be times, and you're like, you know, that person is an idiot. And that person is objectively an idiot. And then there'll be other times where you're like, you know what, not every book is going to work for every person. I'm sorry, you know, if you say there's not a laugh to be found, I can point you to 50 other reviews that say it's laugh out loud funny. So it's just you. Every once in a while, there'll be a review where you're like, oh, man, they're on to me. That <laughs> he has hit a problem that I'm aware of that I hope no one else would see. And then you kind of, you know, please let no one see that review. Because I'm kind of known, I have fun sharing bad review quotes because you get a lot more interaction with that. If I share a review that says, Jeff Strand's latest is a wonderful thrill-packed masterpiece, no one actually cares. But if someone's on one saying, Jeff Strand is a horrible person, he, what kind of depraved freak would write this? Stuff? <laughs> and I share that. And that gets all the likes and all the retweets. So I, you know, I enjoy sharing it. But mm -hmm. there are the reviews where you think, no, they actually, they're making a good point there. So I'm going to, slink away and hope that that one goes you know unnoticed because you know i there are the reviews that you feel yeah okay that that is a worthy negative opinion of my work and now i'm just going to pretend it didn't happen yeah <laughs> yeah and that is of course how i really feel that people are entitled to their own opinion just in case anyone didn't get the the dry monotone sarcasm there yeah. but <clears throat> No, y'all are different than me. I hunt them down. Hunt yeah. <laughs> yeah. in season. Well, what's funny is it never works. So, because I've you know I've never gotten mad or offended, but I try to be a smartass, and it, it doesn't work. So, somebody had posted a one-star review of my young adult book, A Bad Day for Voodoo, and it was like, this book isn't funny. This book is stupid. It's horribly written. Why would any you know what a piece of garbage? So I said. Hi, since you did not enjoy A Bad Day for Voodoo, you will also not enjoy my other book. And I listed off some other book. And I thought I was just being funny. And I thought that the tone was successful. And she said, you know, I'm sorry I offended you, but I just really didn't enjoy the book. And I came back and said, well, no, you didn't offend me. I was just going to be funny. But at that point, I've lost. Yeah. You know, the point goes to her. I've, I'm now struggling to explain that, you know, no, no, you didn't offend me. I you know i'd lost and what i like about goodreads is that if you click on a one-star review of goodreads there's a message saying you may feel like you want to yes. respond <laughs> yeah. strongly yeah. discourage that it's mm -hmm. because you try to be funny and it doesn't work it up it tends to backfire so mm -hmm. i generally you have to ignore them although i you know I, aside from pulling the anonymous quote and sharing it you know i never call the people out I always, you know, anonymous Amazon reviewer. So I'm not trying to get hate mail sent to anybody, but, you know, trying to respond to it directly doesn't work. And also, I've seen other writers, you know, where they get genuinely upset. And that is an embarrassing display where it's like, you know, how dare you criticize all my hard work? Let's see you write a book. 
And then you're just embarrassed for them. It's like, oh, cringe, cringe, cringe. This is making my stomach hurt. Don't ever, ever do that. You, you know, no matter how bad the review hurts, you never engage them in a negative way. Right. Yeah, and I see that. And it, it, usually it happens like on social media, probably about once a month. And it's especially if it's somebody I've know that I've known, you know, or maybe you just know them through social media. It it, it is very embarrassing. I'll, I'll take I'll take like okay, well, Twitter's not for me today because I just don't want to. It's so cringeworthy, you know. And I just, ugh. Yeah, you know, when I was in, uh, I took a creative writing. I was a creative writing major in college, and I was in a class and. The classes would generally be you turn in a story and the entire class critiques it and you sit there and you take it and one guy couldn't take it. He just every comment he would get mad and, you know, defensive and angry and it was just the whole class was just really uncomfortable because he just he was not prepared for people to say anything bad about his work and you can't do that, you know, the if you choose to go into really any creative profession you know whatever it is people are going to say your book sucks and that's always you know my advice generally is think of your favorite book in the entire world and go on amazon and there'll be someone saying one star this book is crap yeah so you know no matter how much you love a book someone hates it yeah mm -hmm. That is true. I do look at the the Goodread reviews, and sometimes when I get a negative review, I'll click through to the profile, and then if I see, oh, they've also given a negative review to books I love, I feel strangely comforted, like, well, yeah. you, you didn't like this book by Paul Tremblay or Ryu Murakami, and I think they're masterpieces, so... You know, yep. like also if if it's like, oh, you gave me one star and you gave Tremblay one star. Well, I'm honored that you think yeah, I'm as good. I, I know that's what I'm taking away from it. Um, one one mm -hmm. review also said that my story was like a bad Black Mirror episode. And I thought, well, Black Mirror is one of my favorite shows. And even a bad episode is pretty good. So I'll take that one. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you use the pull quote as good as Paul Tremblay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like a Black Mirror episode. <laughs> just, just admit that that one word. I mean, it's what they say. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've never seen a bad Black Mirror episode. I think every one of them is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there's always that contrarian person who's gonna, you know, no matter no matter what it is, they they don't like anything, you know. Every the most popular thing that's out there, the most popular book, most popular movie, everyone's like, and it, there's always that one person who doesn't like anything, and you start to realize that it's not the product, it's them, <laughs> and then you like, well, that's probably an unfollow right there because I just don't need all that negativity in my life. <laughs> yeah, there was a recent thing with someone, you know, doing a social media post saying, you know, Stephen King is the most overrated author out there, and if he started today, he wouldn't have a career. Like, what? I've seen that. Like, are you out of your mind? You, know, I, you don't have to like every, <laughs> nobody likes every single Stephen King book, but saying he can't write is insane. Yes. There are Stephen King books that he don't like. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, I don't even understand that King comment. And I think if you're going to say something like that, you know, back it up maybe explain <laughs> explain your your quote a little bit more but i i don't know and as we said earlier i mean putting out opinions or sweeping statements on the internet is never it doesn't always end well and i mean even like you said with your responding with a humorous comment unfortunately when you're reading text i mean all that tone gets lost tone and nuance on on the yeah. internet and you know people are reading it in in the voice in which they perceived it to have been written which can be radically different <laughs> to the voice you did write right. it in right i think the assumption is if you're responding to a bad review you're angry yeah so if i'm if i'm reacting with amusement 
the person who wrote the bad review is not, you know, they don't write the review thinking, hey, I think this will amuse the author. They're thinking, if the author reads this, they're going to be pissed. So when I respond with amusement, they think, oh, he's angry. Yeah. So it, you don't, and when I share review quotes, I don't actually add, you know, any kind of commentary. It's pretty much, I pick quotes that stand on their own. You'll be like, you know, worst piece of garbage ever. Reader, unimpressed with my latest book. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and I don't, you know, I never try to set it up as, you know, let's, let's get them. Let's take them down. It's always, you know, I'm always anonymous about it. And I, you know, not interested in turning it into a negative. It's supposed to be funny. So, and on my own page where people know the tone, it works. But when you're on their territory by responding directly to the review, then the tone doesn't come through. So if you take one piece of advice away from this episode, it is do not respond to one star reviews of your own work directly. All right. There's a, a takeaway. And I mean, something that I mentioned to you off air is in a lot of your fiction, there's a, invariably the removing of or losing of limbs and indeed as i say that i'm i'm not sure there's really a question attached to it it's just something i'd like people to be yep. aware of so now you all know yeah i'm very much aware of it what happens is it just it keeps coming up as a plot device that's necessary and i think man i can't do this again and then it's like well there's no other way around it so it's it's kind of an inside joke where you know people are aware of it. you know people lose a lot of body parts in my books and I try to avoid it but what happens is my storytelling tends to take me to places where people need to lose body parts and you know I always want to default to them not losing a body part but you know so it's never ever a case of well no I've gone through you know 200 pages of this book and no one has lost a pinky so it's time to fix that it's always oh wow i think this character needs to lose a pinky but i always have people losing pinkies what can i do differently well no this the the storytelling decisions i've made up to this point require that this character lose a pinky and then they do so yeah it's it happens all the time you know i have not actually seen anything one star Jeff Strand all he can do is chop off body parts but yeah it, <laughs> it is a common motif I don't know what that says about me I have all my body parts so it's not like you know as a one-armed writer I feel that my character should also have one arm it, yeah it, <laughs> yeah this story by Jeff the amputator strand and totally yeah. obliterated my psyche because I am an amputee. That would be, I don't know. <laughs> that would probably be pretty bad. Yeah. Nope. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. And I love just the absurdity of so many of those short stories. I mean, on, on the, the limb losing front, there's the one with the character who discovers a slot machine. It's going quite well. And then, he loses yeah. his, his pinky, but then it's like, well, I mean, try again. And, you know, there's an opportunity to win that back. But, oh, no, bloody hell, another one's gone. And I, yeah, it, <sighs> there's something so, so humorous and dry about these situations. But there's almost this absurd logic that the protagonists have. And it, it just makes for compelling and, and brilliant fiction. And there's, there's almost uh, British sensibilities to it, which, of course, w was enhanced while listening to the audiobook, seeing as it was narrated by a British narrator. Yeah, I, I had quite a few auditions for... He's um, narrated all three of my short story collections. And... The um, the audition was the short story was called Pet Cemetery, but it's misspelled even worse. Yeah, so it's like it is it's an you know Pet Cemetery is a misspelling of how Pet Cemetery should be misspelled. So my spoof of that was misspelled even worse, and it was really one line delivery, and I can't remember the specific line was so perfect that I said I need this guy, and then he said, "Well, do you want me to switch accents?" and trying that like 
yeah, do whatever you want for whatever you think is best for each story. But yeah, it was the, because there is a British sensibility in my writing, which, you know, I'm not a British person, but like we already discussed Monty Python and the Holy Grail, but in terms of literary, my biggest influence was uh, Douglas Adams. So, um, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy blew my mind because I could not imagine that you could be allowed to publish a book that was that silly. I was like, that's absolutely insane. So, you know, um, the British, there's a, always kind of a British inspiration. So like um, Fangboy also has a British narrator because that's kind of how I heard it in my head while I was reading it. But yeah, when Andy Barker auditioned, I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then he's gone on to do all three of my short story collections. So, and he, if I do a fourth short story collection, he will hopefully narrate that one too. Cause I think that the British voice lends itself really well to my short stories, which tend to be goofier than the um, novels. You know, I haven't done anything in a long form that's as insane as the short story high stakes that you mentioned, which is, mm. the, you know, pinches off your finger. So if you play again, if you don't play again, you've lost a finger. If you play again, you can get back your finger and they can be surgically reattached. So it's, is, are you willing to risk losing another finger to get your first finger back? And there's a logic to it where you say, yeah, maybe that would be the way to go. But of course, it's a horror story and it's not the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, to segue, kind of unrelated, that story was the first thing of mine to ever be done as a class project. A um, high school student emailed me and said, hey, I have to present a story. I have to read the story in front of the class and then do an analysis of it. Can I do high stakes? And I was like, yeah. And she got an A on it. So I am contributing to good grades of students around the world. And back then, High Stakes is one of my first published stories. So back then, having a high school student say, I want to cover your story for my class was like, yes, yes, finally, I have achieved what I have always been striving for. Well, that's certainly a better email to receive than the one I saw Blake Crouch talking about the other day. So he also got an email from a high school student who needed to analyze one of his stories. But the student said that, unfortunately, they wouldn't possibly have time to read it all. So would it be possible for him to provide a quick summary of what oh, actually happens? <laughs> I've got oh, that dear. too. I've got ones where it's like they're asking quite you realize they just want you to write the book reports because, you know, in my day you couldn't do that. But now you can message any author you want and just say, Hey, could you send me five hundred words on your story? So I've also I my young adult stuff, I go into schools and talk and then I'll get the thank you notes later. And then thank you notes are, you know, Thank you, Mr. Strand, for coming into our classroom. You were very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Strand, for coming into our classroom. I love your books. But then there was one that was, Dear Mr. Strand, I had to read your book for my book report. And to be honest, it was terrible. It wasn't funny at all. I hate your book. And it was slipped right in there with the um, all the letters of praise. And so, of course, you say, okay, well, which letter did you take a picture of blocking out the student's name and post on social media. And of course it was the one I hate your book. Yeah. I just, I was very amused by the idea that this kid would just, because it wasn't, you know, I was disappointed in your book. It was, I hate your book and active tense, not I hated your book, but I hate your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still ongoing. He's still, he's still hating your book. <laughs> yeah. He, he's not over it. This isn't, I didn't enjoy your book two weeks ago, but I'm over it. It was, I'm currently in the active state of hatred of the words that you made me read. Maybe it was a cry for help. He wanted to know, you know, what's the remedy? I'm still filled with this <laughs> hatred. What does one do? Well, probably not read another one of my books. Um, That's a good it Sounds like he was actually hating the fact he had to write a letter. It was probably graded on. I think that... <laughs> There was probably an element of that, too. Yeah. But he did specifically say he didn't think the book was funny at all. Yeah. Well, yeah, that too. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting how you do seem to have a number of people telling you that they didn't find <laughs> your books funny, and you know, it's, it's yeah, it's almost as if comedy is subjective. It's like, you know, it's a small percentage. Generally, the feedback is pretty positive. It's like, you know, if you've been doing this, you know, my first book was published twenty years ago, and I published lots of books since then. So it's not going to be. 100% people saying, wow, great job. It's going to, you know, you get the, you know, you get a wide variety. And what tends to happen is if you're a comedy writer, it's funnier when you get a kid saying you hated your book. You know, yeah. you can have 50 kids saying, thank you so much. You were inspiring. I love talking to you. Thank you so much for signing my book. But the one that sticks out is the kid who's like, no, your book was a bunch of crap. And you wasted my valuable education time by coming into my classroom and I hope to never see you again. That's, yeah. That's the one that sticks out. That's the one that's an entertaining anecdote for the podcast. You know, if I, if I said, Oh man, you guys, listen, I'm going to tell you all these great letters I received, you know, 10 minutes into it, you'd be like, okay, we, <laughs> we get it. They, they enjoyed your visit. Let's move on. We have listeners to entertain, but the kid who hated me is much better as a podcast anecdote. Yeah. 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 You'll notice, you know, when we started off, I didn't tell you a story of something smart I did as a kid. I told you how dumb I was to break to the ice. That's, <laughs> that's where the entertainment value lies. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. There's I, a psychology to it. <laughs> right. I know you've said before that yeah, you can get annoyed by books where they use inappropriate humor or it's kind of inserting comedy at a point where I guess the story needs to be taken seriously. So I wondered if you could talk us through some of these and perhaps tell us a little bit about the don'ts of horror comedy, some of the pitfalls to try and avoid falling down. Well, a lot of it is really just, you know, are you violating the believability of the situation? Now, believability is very different from realism. Very little of what I write is truly realistic. There's always that, you know, element where it's more stylized. Maybe characters, you know, it's something I'm writing. It's not a transcript. Transcripts, people tend to babble in this stuff. So people tend to be wittier in my books than people are in real life. So, you know, there's that element, but it's got to be believable. So the really the common problems are just funny moments at a time when the characters would be taking them seriously. So if a character throws out a snappy one-liner that's too clever for what someone would be saying in that moment, then that it, the humor becomes distracting. And I will actually do that and then you get rid of them in future drafts. I've gotten a lot pretty much I don't cut that much for that reason, I can't get rid of that during the active writing process. But, you know, as I developed as a writer, you would say, okay, that moment is not a appropriate moment for someone to be saying something. So that's where a lot of it is, you know, with the tone you've set up, are you violating the believability of the situation by what the characters are saying? And also, you know, it's as far as not the stuff that's not dialogue, it really just comes down to, you know, what tone should you be creating at this moment you know if if the movie is um tucker and dale versus evil everything is at the service of the comedy so as funny as it can be throughout it's all appropriate because the movie is a comedy with a horror premise it's not a horror movie with humor in it but um if it's a more serious thing if the horror is meant to be taken seriously it's like okay what point are you sillier than what the tone is that's been set up? At what point are you violating the characters? You know, is it too much humor where it's interfering with the, you know, actual suspense? You don't, you know, humor in the middle of a suspense scene can be very effective if you can take them back up to that level. So if there is a, mass killer walking through my house and I'm hiding in the closet and they're going room to room to room. If I have a big house and they're going through 50 rooms, room 49, well, I guess room 49 would be, but 
room 30 is not as suspenseful as room 10 as the you know the killer's going through so you throw in a laugh to sort of diminish the suspense and then you bring it back up but if if the laugh is you know too funny or too goofy and it makes it too difficult to bring the suspense back to the original level then you have failed and if the laugh is inappropriate if it's you know out of character which is one of the most common problems just the character wouldn't say that that's the author trying to be funny and not the character doing something appropriate and you'll see a lot of that in my early work where i wanted it to be funny whether it was appropriate to the character or not so it's really you know my long babbling answer basically breaks down to what is appropriate for the tone and for the believability of the situation not realism but believability it's like and i will get that wrong a lot of times in the early stages but then i sort of figure out the exact tone i'm going for and then make sure it's consistent beyond that so when you say early stages you obviously go through like most writers like multiple drafts do do you do you start off with like an outline to me I would think that if you're trying to, to unless it's like just comes like super super naturally to you there's some thought in there and you probably have to have some at least some kind of notes but at the same time reading your work it's like it's got this flow that just feels like there's no way he could outline this it just it's happening so natural so i guess i guess the question is is are you are you a plotter or a pantser <laughs> i i think the official stupid term is planter <laughs> I'm both. And it varies a lot per book. It depends on what the book requires. Mm -hmm. So, but let's go with Ferocious. Ferocious was mostly a pantser book. It was these two characters are trapped in a cabin in the woods. The forest is surrounded by zombie animals. Their goal, they before the outbreak, their truck got stuck in the mud. So they had to abandon it three miles from the cabin and walk to the cabin. Like in the morning, we'll go get it out of the mud. That's a problem because the um, zombie animals have started. So their goal is to get to the car, the truck that is three miles away. So it's a very dangerous three mile trek. And then once they're in the truck, they should be relatively okay. So ending of the book, they get to the truck. That was my end goal. Everything I write is working toward the goal of getting to the truck. But I hadn't really, you know, I, I had a couple of set pieces. You know, there's going to be a zombie grizzly bear breaking into the cabin. That's going to be an amazing scene. And a couple other ideas, but for the most part, it was like, no, I'm just getting myself to that end point. And because it's a pretty straightforward story, I don't need to do a lot of um, pre preliminary work on it. So mm -hmm. my book, Sick House, I knew the um, there's a twist halfway through where it's sort of it's a haunted house story that sort of switches horror genres halfway through. You know, the tone stays the same throughout the book, but it goes from haunted house to a different genre. And so I knew that point. I knew I knew that I was building toward the halfway point where things mm -hmm. change. You know, clowns versus spiders, I knew, you know, I basically I thought, well, at some point, you know, it's it's a fun book, so it's not going to have this nihilistic everyone dies at the end ending. But I didn't really know that much beyond it. But meanwhile, Dweller was outlined chapter by chapter. Like I knew before I started writing, I knew everything that was going to happen in that book. So it changes, you know, from book to book. And it's kind of how much do I need so I'm comfortable that I will not hit a point where I realize that I've screwed up and have to throw out 50 pages or where I'm comfortable that I have a complete story. I knew that I could, you know, I've got a full book in Ferocious. I'm just going to have so much nonstop action. It's going to be great. Um, my book Pressure was, I knew it's in four parts. I knew the end of each part and I knew the beginning where each part would pick up, but I didn't necessarily know the in-betweens. And it just, it varies a lot. You know, the more Mm -hmm. If something is more um, mystery oriented, like blister, blister, there's a mystery. There's an incremental revelation of 
what happened before the story began. And that I had to know. You know, I wasn't making that up as I went along because it had to be consistent with what was happening in the present day. So I knew, you know, each incremental revelation. Uh, my mm -hmm. Pretties has a big twist in it. And I knew the twist and I you know, knew how I was going to reveal each layer of it because I needed that. You don't make up a jaw-dropping twist um, on the spot. You, I, guess right. you can. I don't. So I needed to know because what you think is happening in my pretties is not necessarily what's happening. And so I need to know that ahead of time. But I didn't have the story plotted out very far beyond that. Once all the cards are on the table, then I kind of switch to full-on pantser. And then, okay, now what do I do to resolve this? But um, mm -hmm. I needed, because there's a twist, I needed to be consistent. I needed you to say, oh, that makes, I didn't see that coming, but it, it's consistent with everything that has happened up to that point. So books like uh, Blister and My Pretties that are, that have twists in them, you know, the dun, 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 those mm -hmm. I always know ahead of time. You know, uh, Bring Her Back has a late twist. And, you know, I knew that ahead of time, so I was kind of always aware of that. But um, beyond that, it can depend. It tends to be if it's more thriller suspense, I'm, I feel like I need to know more about it than if it's um, more straightforward horror. So. Yeah, I would think also that that probably... To, I don't know. For me, it seems like like more character driven. The the deeper I get into the character, the less I really want to to plot out stuff. But at the same time, if I'm working on something that's a, that's like you said, a mystery, it's something that has some complexity to it, as in complexity and how the character. You know, characters are going to work for and against each other dynamically. That's something that that I got. I have to write down. I have to go. Okay, so so and so acts like he likes so and so, but he doesn't. You know, and it's almost like by by doing that, then that allows me to really get into the character a little bit more. But you know, every like you said, every everyone every project's different. Every yeah. project is different. Yeah, you know, I, my preference, if you said, okay, what would be your ultimate style? My ultimate style would be pure pantser, because that's what mm -hmm. I don't like the process of outlining that much. I have more fun when I don't know what's coming, but I'm a full time writer who has to be prolific, you know, so I need to get, you know, a pretty steady stream of books out there, which takes away the luxury of getting halfway through and saying, oh, you know what? I need to backtrack because I messed up. So that the I kind of need to not waste my time when I'm writing. And the mm -hmm. full answer means backtracking at times. So we say, "Ooh, you know what? That didn't work out. Let's try this angle." Okay, that didn't mm -hmm. work. Try this thing. Or I'm stuck. Okay, I'll get unstuck, but maybe it's going to take me two weeks of brainstorming to get unstuck. I don't have that luxury, so I have to outline to some degree, depending on the project, just to make sure that I keep up my writing momentum because not keeping up my writing momentum means that I'm returning to a desk job, which is my <laughs> very, very intense goal is not to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course the outlines are always flexible. I'm never locked into an outline. It's never, Oh man, I wish I, you know, wish I hadn't committed to that chapter four thing. I can always change it. And I frequently do, but it's, you know, you can take the side trip on the roadmap, but you still you have the roadmap to keep you going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to spend so much time on my outlines. I believe the opposite that it was locked. It was it, it was etched in stone. Could not change it. I've I've spent weeks on this. I thought I'd all out. Nothing's going to deviate from this. And then trying to write, it's like, oh well, I can't get past page thirty. Fuck, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> all you're, you 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 blew it. You know, it's taken me a long time to realize that. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I wrote actually kind of relevant, amusing anecdote, I sold uh, my novel Dweller to Leisure based on a very thorough outline. They basically made me write it, you know, chapter by chapter. Because basically they weren't convinced that um, 
this story would work because it's it's a weird story. It covers sixty years. It's a friendship of a boy and sort of a Bigfoot creature. So it, I get the idea that you want to know beginning to end how the story is going to play out. So I wrote you know a full outline. They sent me the contract. And then um, I wrote the book, and there were moments where I said, okay, I'm going to diverge from the outline. And then they sent me the back cover copy before the book was turned in. I was like, oh, okay, just FYI, that part I changed. So that's a little inconsistent. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't get to change the outline. We, we agreed on this outline. And so I got a stern lecture about um, you know not changing the outline in midstream. But I don't think that's typical. I think that most of the time they understand the creative process what happened with dweller was that another author had not turned in a book on time so they said we've got an open slot but you have to deliver it quickly it has to be you know really tightly written you know it can't be something that's going to require a lot of editing so they wanted you know it to be exactly like the outline that they had signed off on but but i did get a lecture for diverging from my outline but since then you know, I can, I can change a lot. I can change a little. I can do whatever I want. Never get locked into a plan because if sometimes a better idea comes along, but it's good to have the plan whether you stick to it or not. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror Podcast with Jeff Strand. Join us again next time for the second and final part of the conversation. And that also wraps up the end of 2020 for This Is Horror Podcast. We have put 63 episodes out this year, so that may be a personal best. It's certainly close if it isn't, and we're not slowing down. We've got a lot of great conversations coming up in 2021. We've already recorded conversations with the likes of Richard Chismar, Rena Mason... Gemma Amor, Sarah Langan, and many more. So get ready for all of that. And if you want to support us as we come into the new year, and it's been a rough time, both personally and professionally this last year, then do consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. You're going to get early bird access to every episode. You can submit questions to each and every interviewee. And you can get exclusive podcasts such as the Q&A sessions and Story Unboxed and indeed the video cast on camera, off record. So a lot to be excited about. Head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror. See if it's a good fit for you. All right, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. In Black Crane's Tales of Unquiet Women... Horror writers of Southeast Asian descent reject and embrace these traditional roles in a unique collection of stories which dissect their experiences of otherness. Black Cranes is a dark and intimate exploration of what it is to be a perpetual outsider. Featuring 14 stories by acclaimed writers and including a foreword by award-winning writer Alma Katsu. Omnium Gatherum is thrilled to be a sponsor of This Is Horror. Enter the code THISISHORROR with no spaces at checkout for a 20% discount. If you're an emerging author in the UK, Storyville is offering its first ever online contemporary dark fiction class in 2021. Running from 16 weeks from May to September at 8pm London time, there are weekly essays, assignments, and readings to help you hone your craft. Richard Thomas runs Storyville. He's an experienced author, editor, teacher, and publisher who has been nominated for the Bram Stoker, Shirley Jackson, and Thriller Awards. Use the code HORA10 to get 10% off. Head on over to storyvilleonline.com today as spots are limited. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And this is from May Jemison. Don't let anyone rob you of your imagination your creativity, or your curiosity. It's your place in the world. It's your life. Go on and do all you can with it and make it the life you want to live. I'll see you in the next episode for the second and final part of the conversation with Jeff Strand. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, Keep on writing and have a great 
great day. This is Horror Podcast. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we and chat with... Peppa Pig. Hang on. And what Peppa Pig? You want to watch Peppa Pig? Yes. Well, you're in the wrong room then, aren't you? And what Peppa Pig? Yeah, so shall we go to the living room? And what... And this is horror? You want this as horror? Yeah. Okay, so just let me let me record the intro. You get to hear it live, okay? Okay? Yes. Okay. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co host Bob Pastorella. I'm a Peppa Pig Pastorella. Peppa Pig Pastorella. Yes. What are you talking about? You can't have Peppa Pig Pastorella. It's not Bob isn't a new character on Peppa Pig.